the service of the Lord's Day, the sixth Sunday after Pentecost, the 9th of July, 2023, Community Church of Syosset. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son <coughs> except the Father, and no one knows the Father, except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Jesus served the risen Lord.
Praise is due to you, O God, in Zion. And to you shall vows be performed. When deeds of iniquity overwhelm us, you forgive our transgressions. Happy are those whom you choose. And bring near to one of your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple, your silence, the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves. Let us worship God. Friends, 
we stand in need of mercy, reconciliation, and conversion. Let us pray to the God who will pardon us and lead us. God, you have set before us life and prosperity. Death, Death and adversity. You call us to obey your commandments. <coughs> to love the Lord our God. To walk in your ways. And observe your commandments, decrees, and ordinances. We confess that our heart has turned away. We do not hear. We are led astray to bow down to other idols. And to serve them. You have set before us life and death. Blessings and curses. Lord, forgive us. Help us choose life. And hold fast to you. Let God's people search their hearts in silence. My friends, the light comes not to sear and blind <coughs> us, but to save us. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. In his name, I declare to you, your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
let us turn to our scripture lesson this morning. It's taken from the book of Romans, and it's a famous piece written by Paul, where he struggles with his experience of not being able to live the way he wants to live. The experience of sin within him. And the prayer that it's in Jesus Christ that he will be saved. So, many times we do wonder what is the place of understanding sin in our lives and in the world. And this scripture begins to, is one of the places that we can begin to look to see what it means within us and perhaps what it means within our neighbor. We listen to Paul's letter to the Romans. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want. But I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind. Making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. May God bless this reading of Holy Scripture to our understanding. And wow, what an understanding that might be, right? If we dig right into what St. Paul is talking about, at least in the plain sense of it, Paul is saying, I know right from wrong. I want to do good, but I don't. And since I want to do it, and I'm not doing it, matter of fact, I'm doing what I think is evil, it must not be me. It must be the sin that is within me that's doing it. Wretched man that I am, I live in this body of sin as though he's captive by a body that has its own will to do evil. And we might look around as proud people and say, well, I don't got that problem. I do exactly what I want. I know what I'm doing. Anybody ever think that of themselves? If we're honest... We spend a great deal of time, and most of the time, we guess what? We're able to do just exactly what we want to do. Most of the time. Anybody here ever uh, start out on a diet? <laughs> you know, you're feeling good. You have your cup of, uh, what, what do you have? You have your grapefruit and black coffee for breakfast, Right? You have your, uh, uh, your, your, your little something for lunch, not too much, and dinner is very sensible. What happens around 11 o'clock at night? Where, where do you find yourself? Is the ice cream safe? <laughs> Are you on that occasion doing what you do not want to do? That's something we can all relate. You know, sometimes it's easy to stand in judgment of people that have pretty severe addictions, right? Why don't you just not drink? 
Well, for most people that are in trouble with drinking, how many times do you think they have said to themselves, I shouldn't drink? And yet, what do they do? They drink. Well, just don't gamble. You don't have to call your bookie up. And yet, what do they do? No. Oh, and yes, without going into any detailed examples, do the same things happen with people who have inclinations to things like, you know, affairs and lasciviousness? Well, it does. Hating yourself in the morning doesn't necessarily guide your directions the very next evening. We know this to be true. And so, when we say, you know, I am very grateful for the chance to do just what I want to do, take a breath. Now, is it always, are all your failures sin? No. I remember I showed up once to a professor. I went to his room. We, we in my seminary, was very small and things were a little casual. And, you know, I just told him I needed to, uh, paper was due at class. I said, I just need to go up and print it off. We'll like, last couple of things. Just, just have it for dinner time. So I brought the paper to his rooms for dinner time. And I said, I'm sorry, it's a B paper. It's not, not my best work. Could have done better. And he said, well, I, I, you're probably right. It's a B paper. I, I, I expect you know what, what kind of work you did. But could you have done better? And I said, well, I mean, if I would have spent more time on it and, you know, maybe edited it more and spent an extra day and did this and this and, you know, had a few more citations, I'm, I'm sure I could have made it into an A paper. And he says, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that had, had you done all of those things that, that you're saying that it would have been an A paper, but could you have done all of those things? And he, he said, look, and I know what you're doing. You have this responsibility, this responsibility, and guess what? We also tell you that you need to network and fellowship and you need to spend some time and rest and relaxation and we don't want you wrecking your sleep either and you have to exercise and you have to do all of those things. Did you really have time to do an A paper for me? You. And I said, I guess I didn't. And he said, no, I didn't think so either. And B will be fine. And he gave me a B on the paper. You know, exactly the grade I deserved but without the feeling that I had been neglectful and not done what I ought to have done, right? Given who I was, given the circumstances of my day, in a sense, his, that professor's kind words, his name is Robert, Professor Robert Hayden, by the way, that professor's kind words rescued me from a little bit of self-loathing for not having done as well as I ought to have done. He had some compassion on me and asked me to have compassion on myself and to be more realistic. Now, one of the things that I think is important for all of us, and I've said this in sermons before, is that our expectations if things don't turn out the way we want them to, our re expectations are unrealistic. How do we know this? Because what's real is how it turned out, and your expectations are different than the way they are. So if you expected things to turn out differently than the way they did, guess what? Your expectations were unrealistic. You can go back and you can say, all right, where was I off? Now the question is, Is that sin? Well, maybe you're just unwise, right? Maybe you just didn't have good foresight. Paul is talking about something that he regards as being evil. Something that he can't seem to help. 
and he is wretched about it. It's as though his body is leading him to do something he doesn't want to do. That's why so many people have looked at this, is this some kind of addictive behavior, or compulsive behavior, is this some kind of a depression, or is this some, some kind of a mania, or what, what was going on behind, we don't know. We just don't know. We don't know what the thorn was in his side. We just know he had one. But also he looked at that as being something to be saved from, not necessarily as something that was absolutely constituent of himself. That he could be rescued from this. Has anybody here ever been in a class in elementary school where there was a substitute teacher? How about a substitute teacher that was not good at their job? <laughs> Most aren't, by the way. It's probably why they're substitute teachers. But anyway, uh, not always, not always. Now, could you blame those kids for being bad? Because the kids are bad, right? Ah. Can you blame the kids for being bad? You could. I don't know what good it's going to do you. Because as soon as their regular teacher returns, or the vice principal comes in to keep order, guess what happens? The kids behave, right? Things are orderly. What happened there? those kids were rescued from the natural disorder that was in them. They're just being natural human kids. As soon as the usual authority is gone, they're going to they're, they're gonna test the limits that they can, and they're going to have some fun doing bad things, right? You know, and making them, and by the way, making themselves and everybody else miserable. Because we all remember those classrooms, as much as the disorder was, we hated it too, because it was chaotic and we didn't like it anyway. You know, we don't know how to run a classroom properly. We're kids. We're not supposed to. The person comes in and brings order to the situation, literally saves those kids from themselves. I would propose to you that if you had not had people that literally, through their good example, through creating good habits within you, through giving you a vision of what good orderly life could possibly be for you, what ambition and living out your aspirations could be for you. If you didn't have anybody that gave that to you, I would propose that each one of you and me would be barbarians in our lives. It takes somebody pretty extraordinary Actually, it probably takes whole systems of things that are extraordinary to get us not to think about just what's going to happen today and what I need right now, but how to defer gratification for a week or for a day or for an hour or for a year or for five years. Or if you want to talk about somebody going to something elaborate like medical school or law school, seven years, eight years. How do we get people to do that? We're giving them a vision. Otherwise, by our own nature, we're barbarians. We don't naturally know how to treat each other well. But we are social creatures. So we are surrounded by a society and a culture that teaches us how to live. It saves us from ourselves. But even if we have all of that benefit, do sometimes do we still fall to selfishness and egotism? Please, besides me, anybody here fall to selfishness and egotism? No, okay, well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Who is to save me from that? When we ask to be rescued, you know, when Paul asks the Lord, who's going to rescue me? You look to the hills, it's the Lord that rescues you. First of all, it's to know that in our own selfishness and egotism, it's just who we are. Sorry, friends, we got it. It's a part of us now. Will we pray to our God to be freed from its bad consequences and its hold on our lives? And will, be, will we be gentle with ourselves 
in our failings because we will fail. When we read in scripture, what does Jesus come to do? You know, the light did not come into the world to sear and to blind. No, but to save, to show us good ways. The burden that Christ would put upon you. Is it heavy? What did Jesus say? My burden is light. My burden is light. If we are, in effect, struggling, you know, with heavy burdens, especially the burdens we want to place on other people, uh, you know, those burdens, especially those burdens, but if we are struggling under heavy burdens, we might want to say, is this what Christ would want for us? And then you might say, but pastor, we want to be ambitious and we need to discipline ourselves. And if we don't go tough on ourselves, we won't get the good stuff done. Well, maybe. Anybody think like that from time to time? What if the good stuff can just as much be joyful? What if instead of it being, you're operating out of a burden, you're operating out of a sense of opportunity, out of goodness, energized by the possibility that you get to do this? Instead of I have to do it, I get to do it. Well, that's an interior shift of mind, right? And we pray to be rescued from the harshness of judgment in the world, our own judgment and the judgment of others. We pray that following the ways of Jesus will lead us that way. And you might say, well, does that mean I have to give up my, uh, my ambitions and my aspirations? Well, maybe you should give up your unrealistic ones. How about that? You'll suffer a lot less. Pray for wisdom. Maybe some of your ambitions and aspirations are unrealistic. But maybe your ambitions and aspirations can lead you to joy. Hmm. Is that a possibility you can pray for? Your God has a relationship with with you. The Holy Spirit is leading you in good ways. The ways of Jesus are not to harm and burden you to the extent that you are, how can you put it, where you're despondent, you're ready to give up, where you're injured or traumatized. That's not the ways of Jesus. And don't lead other people that way either. The ways of Jesus lead you into opportunity, fullness of life, and joy. So when we talk about Jesus rescuing us from sin, we recognize that we are, are fragile and flawed human beings. Starting with me, friends. Fragile and flawed. We pray, though. I pray that Jesus will lead me into living a life where loving matters more than anything else, with the real opportunities they have, accepting the real consequences of my life and of who I am. Yeah, taking the B, right? Stumbling sometimes. But yet being led to love. Because that is the life that Jesus promises is not going to wear you out or wear you down, but rather you will be fulfilled in your loving. When I say this, I'm very much aware that people have to love others in hard circumstances. And I don't want to take anything away from that. Have we all known caregivers who in hard times 
Their love costs them their time, their energy, years of their life, their focus, their attention. And is it hard? And it is. And can we say, is that not also Christ's burden? And how is that burden light? And those are good questions. I would ask you then to pray for the grace to rejoice in the opportunities that you have, in the love that you show, in the love that can still be reciprocated in the pride that you have, in the care that you show for others, in the pride and the joy that you have, in doing a job as well as you would want it done for you. Does it make it less hard? But in the midst of that devotion, there's the chance for joy. Christ rescues us by training us in the sometimes hard school of devotion that leads us to joy in loving. So be rescued, friends, with the joy of your devoted love. May God bless you and bless us all in reading the Holy Scripture this morning. to turn in your uh, hymnal to number 434, if you would please. Red hymnal. Pastor, what number? 434. And we'll sing one verse. And uh, could I ask you to come and join us for a moment? We're going to sing to you. <laughs> friends, we, sometimes it's hard to say goodbye to good friends. We remember Bob so wonderfully in our choir for so many years. And all the times you've come and visited with us. Okay. And we just love you so much. And we know in North Carolina with your family is the right place. But we're going to miss you anyway. 
Thanks, Jim. And so if we could sing this little song for you, I would like that very much. The first verse. 434. to make a speech, but you can talk to everybody, of, uh, all of us at coffee hour, at coffee hour. Bless you. For Anna, with all of the transitions before her, we wish her all the mercies of God. We pray to the Lord. Amen. Are there other prayers this morning? Joys or celebrations? Yes, Lord. so hard. And I am so glad that we have put beside us the cruel judgments on people who commit suicide, haven't we? I hope. I hope we can. And to remember that people in a moment of blindness can act in a way that we can only trust God has mercy on them, right? And mercy on all of us who remain. So for this young man, for his family, for all who love him, for all, for all the people who might not have done right by him, who feel badly now, that they may be inspired to change, but also for those who suffer from mental illness, from depression, from despair. We pray to the Lord. Lord. Are there other prayers this morning? Well, that fills our hearts, doesn't it? Um, in this week, uh, as we get ready for the memorial service, not this Monday, but the following Monday, the 17th, uh, uh, for Jean Butler, uh, we'll be having that here in the afternoon on Monday the 17th. Uh, let us use this time to remember the contributions that Jean made to uh, so many of us here in the church over the years. Uh, you know, her wisdom, uh, her wit, her devotion, uh, from time to time a bit acerbic, but mostly uh, clear-headed, loving, sometimes all at once. And a good example fine role model in so many ways. Let's use this week to remember her, her ministry, and to profit by her example. So for ourselves, as we prepare for Jean's memorial service, we pray to the Lord. 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 Almighty God, you know the 
many cares that we bring before you. We're barraged each day in the media by so many cares in this world. We pray that you will inspire us to be good to the people we meet, to live justly, kindly, humbly. We pray that you will make us loving in our relations. We pray to the Lord. As, you have, as Paul advised us to do, we pray for all of those who are in authority over us. We pray for those in government. We pray for employers and other people in positions of authority. We pray for those who serve the public in important ways. We pray for our own service in the world. Almighty God, we pray that your kingdom may come and that you may teach us your ways. We pray to the Lord. For all of the prayers that are in our prayer list, for the prayers that are forming in our hearts and finding words, for the prayers that are still private or secret to us, for the prayers that we've promised others. We seek you now in this company of faith. Pray to the Lord. And a special prayer of gratitude for uh, Karen returning to us in health and strength. We pray to the Lord. And so we are bold to pray as our Savior to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God's people say, We serve the Lord.
Good morning, everybody. Um, please join us for coffee and cake as usual. And if you need to contact me, my landline lives again. It has been resurrected. So Hallelujah. see you in the back. <laughs> Well, I, um, would you all let me know if you want the Monocom to Bible study on Thursday night? Let me, just let me know, okay? I'd be very much, very, very happy. But we do a Zoom Bible study, and, and uh, so let, let me know if you would. So you have my email. Please let me know. And uh, because if there's something that you want to study, I'm very happy if I know how to either learn it or if I already know it, I'd be very happy to share it. So uh, we've been doing that on Thursday night, Zoom at 7.30. We'll look forward to doing it this week as well. So uh, just wishing everyone well on this uh, muggy day, but we hope that the summer is good to, uh, good to us as we enjoy maybe a little bit of relaxation and begin to dream and envision what our future may be like. So may God bless you all this morning and be with you.